Hello and welcome back to another episode of You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we've got Ellie Payton, who is a head buyer. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Daniel. How are we? I'm okay, thank you. How are you? All good. We were just chatting about the weather a bit off uh, <laughs> off air. It's uh, it's not been great this week, is it? No, no. But think positive. It's, <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. We're going into the summer. Yeah, that's right. Um, Ellie, should we jump straight in then? Uh, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what you actually do? So I'm a head of buying. So that means that I oversee a group of buyers that are bringing product to market. So I specialize in fashion buying, but there's a multitude of different types of buying. If there's a product, there's normally a buyer behind it. But for me, I'm a retail buyer. So it's everything to do with clothing, accessories across menswear, womenswear and kidswear. So you mentioned a buyer can be across different things. What are the actual attributes that a buyer would have? What would they be doing? So from an actual job attribute, you will be bringing product to market and how you will be doing that is working with suppliers and for retail and for fashion, it's normally out of China and India, but there's quite a bit out of Europe now for quick lead time. But what you'll be doing is you will be putting together a range. You will be costing up that range. And then you will be ensuring as part of the critical path that you bring it into your business in in time, basically, for when it's uh, planned to, to launch. So that, that's the role of a buyer. So do you work for a, a specific retailer that um, you're the team for that retailer? Or are you sort of like a, a contract um, team? Yeah. So you would represent your brand. So your business that you work for. And so there's two different ways of doing um, buying within clothing. And one of them is that you uh, buy brands. So you might buy Ralph Lauren, you might buy, um, you know, some streetwear brands, etc. So then you're just selecting from other businesses to bring it into your business to take it to your customers. Customer. but most um, of the UK high street retailers are um, building their own ranges and so it's um, it's all about developing so it's essentially ensuring that the range that you're buying um, represents your brand and that's how that would work yeah I think there was a there's a documentary or a couple of documentary series about um, sort of the new online retailers um and they did a little segment on how they buy and it looks very like the meeting looks quite good fun they all seem yeah. to get around and then and then jump yeah. in and say oh we think this would sell really well based on x y and z is that how it kind of works yeah so you don't really get shrinking violets in buying so <laughs> essentially that's exactly how it works so you have to really know your customer so that's at the heart of it and what you would then do is essentially pull together a range that you think would be ideal for your customer so you you know what they're doing at weekends you know how much money they've got to spend um you just know everything about your customer so you get really really enthusiastic but the, the meetings are amazing because they're very everybody that's in the business is very passionate so it really is you know you're, you're not a buyer just from nine to five if you will be doing it at weekends you'll be on all the blogs you'll be on instagram checking out what everybody's wearing what the trends are so yeah when you come together for the meetings you normally have absolutely everybody in there so it's the designer that you're working with it's the merchandiser that you're working with often your bosses will be in there which will be the directors etc so you're all sort of working together um so yeah a lot of personalities in one room but uh, I think a lot of the documentaries that you see are pretty much how it is, to be honest with you, in the sense of, you, you know, you've got to basically be passionate about the business, but understand what it's going to look like in sort of four to six months. So there's a lot of um, just feel and what you think, as opposed to necessarily it always being um, what the figures tell you. So that's that's why buyers are normally living and breathing the, the ranges and the product. Yeah. So you're obviously responsible for um, what goes in the shop, essentially. But how much of your job role is is that money side, the haggling, the finding these um, uh, suppliers and things like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is the, the job, basically. So essentially what you're doing is there's the fun bit that you guys have seen on the documentaries and then there's getting back to um the uh desk and that is when you are working with your merchandiser so every buyer will uh most buyers some buyers do work on their own but every buyer has an equivalent who is their merchandiser so they're what you know in layman's terms is the money man um they're working the spreadsheets on the budget uh, making sure that you uh, know how much money you've got to spend but you are working collaboratively but what you 
you are also doing is the buyer is negotiating all of the prices, working through the recommended retail pricing, and also just making sure that the whole range is profitable. So you do have to have that acumen to understand the analytics, but also to understand uh, the financials of the business and understand, you, you know, you some of these buyers are working with massive budgets you know an individual buyer could be working with 50 million 60 million even up to 100 million budget yeah and so you know it is a big responsibility and you are ultimately responsible so yeah it's uh you you do have to have that acumen to understand the numbers and to be able to negotiate and then obviously taking it to your day-to-day role you will be talking to suppliers every day and negotiating and obviously in these times <laughs> you're not really getting together face to face so you have to have some uh, uh, really good personality tech uh, personality um behaviors to to get the prices that you need for the product that you you know you want and for how much you want to pay for it so yeah, yeah huge part of the job how much has um, the world of social media influenced um, the sort of career as a buyer? I guess you have to be absolutely finger on the pulse of, of what's going on. Yeah, you've just summed it up, really, Daniel. So when I first started sort of 18 years ago, you bought like Vogue every month and you bought like all of these magazines and you essentially ripped out the pages that you thought would be good for your sort of future range and in a lot obviously China long lead time you'd be working quite far in advance for the majority of your ranges and then getting some of the smaller units out of short lead time like Turkey and Portugal now with social media as you've probably seen on some of the documentaries um, you can have a garment going into um, you know first stage within 24 hours being sent to you a sample to approve you know and potentially you could get product to market that's been made in the UK within kind of a week really and get it out to people if you're really if you've got a good relationship with the factory in the UK so much quicker obviously uh there's certain ethical issues about using China and India and using potential some of their supplies in the UK how do you sort of go about dealing with those issues yeah, I mean, it's a huge thing, Daniel, and it's one of the things I'm per- personally very passionate about and have been since I started in my career. But sort of sustainability and the ethical side of the business is um, a huge, huge issue. And it's something that actually everybody is now fully on board with, um, you know, ensuring that you do the due diligence. So within a business, you'll have an auditing um, arm that will essentially go into factories and check um check through the people that are working there and do that due diligence. But it's actually fully up to the buyer to ask the right questions to ensure that the businesses they're working with are ethically, you know, sourcing. In most retailers in the UK, we're all using the same sort of factories and suppliers. So essentially, we're supporting each other to get those standards up as high as possible. But obviously, the clothing industry, you know, it's a hugely polluting industry. But there are some amazing initiatives going on out there and some fantastic companies that are part of like B corporations, um, just trying to make sure that we we bring this industry up into the 21st century I think it's our biggest challenge to be honest with you so you know to to, to balance between profitability sustainability and ethics but there's some amazing companies out there that are doing some great stuff but it's a huge part now of being a buyer it was something you never talked about when I started but now you know you, you really need to do your own um, background research to make sure that you're not dealing with any suppliers that um, are not working to ethical standards. Mm. And and in the world of, of fashion, let's take, for example, as a buyer, how how different are the uh, sort of because there's obviously levels of fashion, isn't there? Yeah. Or fashion houses and, you know, you've yeah. got high street stuff and then you work your way up to, to the really yeah. high end stuff. Is it easy to apply your skills to those different areas as a buyer or are they very much different? They are different. And I think, to be honest with you, they're not as hugely different. But I would really say to somebody that wants to be a buyer, to pitch yourself into where you want to be initially, because you will get slightly more pigeonholed into that area. So if you're a value, uh, if you've worked in value retail, you're not suddenly going to get employed by Dior. That is just not how it works. And it doesn't, you don't you know move around like that within the business if you in are in value retail you are learning very different skills in the sense of negotiation huge units um you you have massive budgets actually and so the skill set that you're honing is very different to somebody that's buying you know a hundred 
dresses at a thousand pounds each so it very is is very different uh ways of buying so yeah Mm. are you finding that like with any industry that we've had on here recently um the world of tech is really having a big impact on it and you spoke at the beginning about how it's still very much down to the buyer's opinion and, and having their finger on the pulse as to what they choose but is there any tech coming into the business that is sort of evolving that yeah i mean there's a lot of different reporting um uh out there and a lot of yeah lots and lots of new tech that essentially could do it for you <laughs> but um uh, you know uh but the, the thing is with buying yes there is tech out there that can do it for you but really it's about finger on the pulse a computer can't tell you what in six months time is going to be fashionable it just can't you know that is just not going to happen what it can do you is give you as many reports on what has sold well and it will give you a lot of reporting down to neck shape what neck shape does your customer like what length of skirt does your customer like so you've got a lot of reporting there you've got a lot of reporting now um through instagram and um obviously all of social media about the um items that everybody wants to pick up on as quickly as possible so therefore you can react and you can give them then you know five or six different colors of something you can see this reacted really well but from a point of view of seeing into the future that really is a buyer just living and breathing it to be honest with you so it has made big changes and i think it will continue to but it ultimately will not replace a buyer and in, in this business it has to be about feeling of product i think the uh the question on everyone's mind is um how many freebies do you get in samples in this industry? <laughs> yeah everybody loves that don't they? they think that you do yeah look when you start out there's sample sales and um so you know that's why i definitely recommend work for a brand that you love the product for a multitude of reasons um but yeah you get freebies you get freebies and you know, you build relationships with suppliers and, you know, you can go to dinner and stuff like that. But I think um, once you start going up for the ranks, you leave that for the uh, the people that start at the, at, at the bottom of the rung because they're not getting paid the most amount of money. So you <laughs> leave, they, leave those freebies and, um, you know, you, we get sample sales and things like that, which, you know, when you first start out, are absolutely amazing. You see people, the buyer's admins going out of the offices with like five bags of stuff for all of their friends and family, which I think is a really nice thing, actually. Yeah, certainly. Um, for you, obviously, being like the, the head of a team, managing a team, what's that like? How, how do you deal with um, with managing a team? Yeah, I think it's about communication, to be honest with you, and learning about what everybody on the teams, their motivations are. So very much within buying, you know, you might get one buyer that's really driven by the fashionability, by the trend, by working with their designer. You might get another buyer that's really driven by um, the reporting and the numbers and the sales. So when I'm, it's a lot of personality. So realistically, I think how you manage well is to communicate as effectively as possible what the strategies of the business are, short and long term, but also to keep it as a team. So I put in lots of team meetings, lots of catch ups, and a lot of sort of supporting each other. So, you know, and trying to make it fun as well. You know, a Monday team meeting, you know, with a few sweets and a couple of coffees and stuff like that. I think it um, makes everybody a bit calmer on a Monday and, and makes everybody enjoy it a bit more. But I think it's about communication mainly. So pre pre COVID, um, mm. pre lockdown, obviously the world was a very different place. And in buying, um, were there meetings with suppliers? Maybe there's even cut types of brokers between you and the suppliers to help you get deals. Is that kind of, was that part of it going to meetings and, and meeting these types of people? Yeah, no, not for not for me personally, because um, everybody went on furlough. So none of that actually happened. But the companies that stayed open, there was obviously a lot of negotiation regarding supporting each other through COVID. If you had a really good online business, I know like a lot of my friends were still trading. So then there was, you know, a, a lot of support there between the suppliers and um, yeah, and the uh, businesses. But in general, Daniel, a lot went on furlough. So a lot of buyers were either put on furlough. And as you've probably read in the press, a lot of people recently within buying and merchandising have been made redundant. We've obviously had Arcadia, Debenhams, you know, some massive retailers that um you know have completely stopped trading so mm. it, it it wasn't such a big thing because obviously the stores were shut and bricks mm. and mortar for value retail particularly it you know is a, is a massive um uh, lifeline really gone so not so much of that negotiation really 
Mm. Is that something that you think may come back after COVID, after the world goes back to normal, maybe going and meeting with suppliers in person? Or do you think it has moved on to the sort of the world of the internet? I think it's a really good question. I really believe that we should be face to face. I think we should all be, you know, seeing the suppliers because I think also it's you get to learn, know about the person. So you find out about their family, you find out what they do at weekends and motivations. And I think it just builds the relationship. Part of being a buyer is you can obviously negotiate, but you can also influence. And I think, you know, building those relationships needs to happen. But sadly, I don't think many buyers will be traveling, particularly within the next year, two years, really. Um, I think a lot of retailers need to make sure that they've got as much cash flow before they start sending buyers out again. But I, I think it's really, really important. As we all know, if you're negotiating something face to face, it's so much more successful than just sticking it over an email. Yeah, certainly. We've, um, we've touched on it a little bit, but what would be some key personality traits that you see in yourself that you think um, really help in this industry? Yeah, I think it's a really good question, because actually, when you see a lot of job descriptions for buyers, you know, you get the whole Excel word, all of that, you know, that you need to know all of that. But actually, as a buyer, I think behavioral wise, you need to enjoy being around people, building relationships, you need to be able to communicate well at all levels. So whether that's leading a team or then presenting to directors and, um, you know, and making sure that you can present to the board. You need to keep calm and carry on. (laughs) Um, You know, a lot of times things go wrong. We're not dealing in sheet metal. So problem solving is a huge part of the job and adaptability, to be honest with you. So, you know, don't be a buyer or don't think about buying. If you think you're just going to sit at your desk and not put your earphones in and not talk to anybody all day, that's really um, not going to happen. And for you, what would be some of the biggest positives um, and maybe opportunities you've had in your career? Oh, some of the biggest positives is I've had some amazing um, directors um, that have really mentored me and worked to build me and grow me and not particularly with KPIs or part of the business, but they've just seen my passion and taken me under their wing and promoted me and been positive. And I think that's a massive part of the business is that it's a personable job. So therefore you're building relationships. And yeah, I've been really, really fortunate to have, you know, two or three amazing directors that I've worked for who have um, mentored me and uh, yeah, helped me work on those areas that I needed to work on. And what about uh, on the flip side of that, some negatives or less favorable aspects of this industry? Uh, So when you first start out, um, you know, there's a lot of stress in the job. So the negatives of the job is sometimes you could be potentially working for somebody that's particularly stressed. It's fast paced. It's fast moving. So you learn quite quickly from bad managers as quickly as you do from the good managers. But I think ultimately, if you are have common sense and you um, conduct yourself well, then you will get through if there's any, you know, a lot of these buyers are not trained to manage teams. So, um, you know, you're you're learning on the job in a lot in a lot of occasions like that. So that would be the negative bit is hopefully you don't get somebody that you can't get on with day to day because it's a very intimate position. You start um, as a buyer's admin and then you go up to an assistant buyer. Then you go to a buyer and you all sit together every day, the three of you, with the equivalent on the merchandising side. So you have to really be able to get on with people. How important is uh, is networking within the industry? Yeah, huge. It's the same as sort of any of these um it's because it's information sharing and obviously within fashion and clothing, it's all very um, quick. So yeah, you have to network really. And I think particularly, you know, when I first started out, there weren't very many jobs. So I did a lot of work experience. I um, did a lot of working for people for free. And then, you know, as time went on, you know, a lot of positions come up and you are recommended to them because you've got a good reputation. I think my last three jobs were because, I worked with a director previously that knew, you know, uh, what my background was and and how and how I had worked previously or that, you know, and they all know each other and they all talk to each other. So, yeah, networking is a huge part of it. And especially from the sustainability side as well, you know, all of that um, new tech and new initiatives that are happening around that you want to network so you can find out as much as possible, really. I'm unsure. Is it is it a, a big industry? In the, obviously, fashion is huge, um, but obviously, your sort of where you work within it is that is that quite large within the country. 
Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, most of the retailers that I've worked with have had, you know, around 500 stores in the UK um, and Europe. Obviously, I've been at Arcadia and places like that. So value retail is normally massive. So, for instance, you know, you, I would be responsible for a hundred million pound department. And that is then, you know, part of a much bigger business up to 500 million, 600 million pound businesses. So, yeah, it's absolutely huge, the value retail market. And especially if they're on, you know, in bricks and mortar as well, because you'll find one on every um, high street. So, yeah, it's a huge industry. What's your thoughts on on value retail going forward? I mean, obviously the pandemic's had a massive effect, and like you say, bricks and mortar are are very important to it. Where do they go from here? I think we have to embrace sustainability and um, ethical trading. And so, I one of my passions is to take value retail forward, but also to promote. Um, quality so to make sure that you know you might pay a little bit more but that product will last you know as long as you need it to last so we really really have to embrace the future and I, I think it's a I think everybody will want a certain level of value retail, but I don't think everybody now wants the cheap, cheap entry because I think everybody realizes what has to happen to to essentially achieve that. So, you know, I think it's going to be an interesting time over the next few years, but I feel that most retailers, especially in the UK, are very forward thinking now and understand that actually um, quality and sustainability with the value but value for money um all goes hand in hand we talk about um how people can sort of stand out um when they're applying for jobs in in the all these careers yeah. and obviously now a cv is it kind of gets a bit lost in the ether mm. um how can people stand out and show they have a passion for this industry uh, obviously because you know being the head of head buyer you, you're looking uh, for people to come into the business so you would have a good understanding of of what you're looking for yeah, I mean, I think it'll probably be like everybody's answered you at some point, Daniel, but you must know the business that you're going into, but you must know what the role is going to be. So a lot of people will send CVs thinking, you know, if I get a job here, I'll be flying off to Paris next week. And it just doesn't work like that. So I think the people that stand out are the people that really know what it is to be a buyer's admin assistant. So to start at the beginning and understand what that job role is. And luckily, there's a lot of um, information now on the um, on the web, on the Internet to tell you, you know, what those characteristics are that you need and what the day-to-day -day job is so for me that would be somebody that would stand out and also to understand what you could bring to the business so if you really understand the business that you're going into you need to be able to speak passionately about that business so that you can show that if you hit the ground running you would understand the customer so I think those would be the things that kind of stand you out over and above but obviously, if you have managed to get some work experience, um, you know, if you've made clothes, if you're into design, you know, any of those things, a lot of people have their own Instagram sites now where they're bringing together looks, you know, all of those things make you stand out. And for anyone listening, thinking, oh, actually, I'd quite like to be a buyer's assistant. What would that involve? <laughs> So actually being a buyer's assistant, you would be the admin assistant on the department. So essentially you would be managing the critical path. So the critical path will have absolutely every order on. And so it's an Excel spreadsheet. You would be um, dealing with that every day. You would be taking phone calls from suppliers. You would be helping prep meetings for your buyer. You would be taking sample management into account and making sure that, you know, all the everything that's needed for the meetings are um, set up. And then also there will be potentially a lot of uh, responsibility around social media. So normally the admin on the department is responsible for ensuring that, you know, you're sort of promoting your department as much as possible. So it's a really, really, really varied role. Obviously there's probably not a degree or something or even an A-level that um, focuses on fashion buying. Um, yeah, there is. Oh, there is? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to ask, what sort of education would you expect for someone Julie, to go? Yeah. You should know so that as old as podcast. That's yeah. a, that's a great for everything now, to be fair. So. <laughs> so when I started out, no, I did fashion design because that was what you could do. But now there's about 13 universities across the UK that cover about 25 courses. So Manchester Met, De Montford, all of those universities, and they will teach you fashion and buying um, as a BA honours degree. Oh, wow. So you can do, yeah, I mean, I wish it was like, like that in my day because I, I did design and 
it was not for me. Um, so yes, it's now there. So you can specialize. And then also what I'm doing at the moment is I'm actually teaching a government apprenticeship in buying and merchandising. And if you've got a job in a retailer, you can come on this course and it's subsidized by the government. It's only been going for a couple of years and it's the same thing. It's buying and merchandising. So we are covering like every module um, that you would be doing within your job. So you do it as like an equivalent of the old MVQs. So you have a job, but what you do is you are released to be able to learn about your industry so there's a lot more out there now than there used to be for it to that's, be able to sort of that's such a good initiative the way yeah. that so do you need a job in the industry before you can apply to do this apprenticeship yeah for the apprenticeship right. you do so um you know and i mean i've got somebody on the course that's 18 years old and i've got somebody on the course that's 27 28 so you know it's that sort of entry level point but then also there's a that's a level four and then we've got a level six which is if you're a bit more experience but what I would say and I just want to get the message out there because a lot of people don't know about this apprenticeship because it's so new and I do think if you can be quite cheeky if you were starting out in buying and said you know hey bring me on board and look the government will pay for me to be educated within your business you know I think that's a great idea to be honest with you to mm. To sell yourself to say that I'm dedicated to this business um, and I would love to be able to do an apprenticeship in it yeah certainly um we also like to talk about what people could expect to earn salary wise so we go away look at some average figures and see if you would agree with them yeah. so for uh, an entry level buyer you're looking at around uh, 20 to 23000 um and then mid level you're talking possibly uh mid 30s does that sound right exactly yeah spot Perfect. on yeah. Awesome. Um, for you, what is something that's not in the job description? Something you never expected to be having to dealing with within this uh, this role? Ah, uh, good question. <laughs> Probably personalities. You know, that's okay. something that's a skill set point. That when you get up, so at, at each stage in buying, it's presumed that you can, you know, manage teams to a certain extent. So every time you get promoted, you get another person working on your team under you. So that's one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realise is the further up the ladder you go, you will automatically start getting a bigger team and you will start having to manage more personalities. So that's something that I would definitely say to people, you know, it, it is teamwork, but as you go higher and higher, you will be managing bigger teams so um promotion means that you do get uh you know further challenges with um bringing together teams and personality so that's probably the one thing that i really didn't you know realize at the beginning of the career yeah um is there a skill maybe that you wish you could have learned before getting involved in this career that would have helped you yeah um probably the pro is with buying is that you're you're normally quite a strong character you can you know negotiate and and you know hold negotiations but I think it's that listening piece as well so I think if somebody had said to me you know you you also need to be listening as well as just driving forward and getting the product so I think that you know it's really important to when you're working in a team to take time to to listen to everybody as well so I think that's you know, something that people don't really talk about very often, but I think there's a lot to be said for um, making sure that everybody gets their chance to speak because most buyers are quite confident. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a, a big part of the learning, I think. So how, once you're in the industry and, you, you know, you're going for it, how do you progress? Because fashion is, I think, notoriously quite difficult to progress in, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're lucky and you're in a business that's quite well established, you'll be given a PDP plan. And um, within that personal um, development plan, you'll be able to tick off certain, um, yeah, tasks that you have actually done, duties that you've done. But actually within buying to progress further, you have to show that flair. And it's about that commercial acumen that you are actually making money for the business and that you are coming with new ideas and you're living and breathing it. So that's kind of what would stand you apart from somebody else that's just sort of on that tick list to promotion. And I think, you know, it is a uh, money driven business in the sense that, you know, you always need to be making profit. You know, that's the whole point of it. So as long as you are driving the business forward and making profit, you will get promoted. And I think that's what's really nice about the business is 
most businesses, if they've brought you in at the entry level of a buyer, they want to invest in you and they will put you on courses and they will give you that opportunity to, to grow and drive forward. And I think that's something that we all want to be able to do, you know, earn more money and have, you know, responsibility, change of responsibility. So within buying, it's, it is very good like that, really, because if you start, you're never going to stay a buyer's admin the whole of your career. It's just not going to happen. You will go forward if you um, make the right moves. And uh, would you still go into this industry knowing everything you know now? Oh, good question. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was really lucky because I managed to find something at an early age that I absolutely loved. And I think, you know, the skill set that you build and the business, it's fun. It, it you know, it moves forward with trend. It's um, a lot of passionate people around me. So, yeah, I, I would still go into it. Definitely. hundred percent. Well, Elliot, it's been a real pleasure hearing about your uh, your career and, and you've given some great info out. So thank you for coming on. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks very much. Uh, where can people find you on uh, social media? Oh, uh, yes, I am actually um, on LinkedIn just under Ellie Payson. So that would be first port of call. Awesome. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Ellie. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks so much.